I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and for the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about the Qadr of Allah. Now, before I get started, I want you to sit back and be ready, because you're going to hear some things today. Might shock you a little bit, make you wake up. I'm going to translate the word Qadr as best I can to English and tell you that it, it's something similar to destiny or predestination or kismet, as they call it. It means that everything is already planned. Everything is already done deal. It's all written. There's nothing you can do except go through the motions that are planned for you. Now, right away, you're going to have some folks say, well, if that's all there is, why bother? And that's a good question. Why bother? Does Islam insist on this qadr, this predestination, as it were? What about other religions? Have you looked to other religions to see what they say about it? Is everything in the control of God? Is there anything that can happen that he has no control over? Because if you say yes, then this is not the God of Islam. Because Allah, the God of Islam, always has full and complete control over everything. Immediately, even some Muslims will say, well, wait a minute. Hold on, doesn't it say in the Quran, and haven't I heard you quote from it, the verse in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 256, La din, that there's no compulsion in the way of Islam. And if that's the case, then how could I be forced by God to do something when you just got through saying I wouldn't be forced? I don't understand. Another argument that would come up immediately from anybody would be, well, hold on. If everything is already written, then why is it that some people would get to go to paradise and other people would have to go to hell? Because if it's all in the power of Allah, if God is the one doing all of this, then why punish us? What did we do? Still another argument comes. Look, if everything's already written for me, then I can go out and do anything bad. I can steal, I can lie, cheat, drink, smoke, do whatever I want to do because I will say that, hey, it was written for me. I can't help it. What's the validity of their argument? Consider and think. Is there such a thing as predestination? Is there such a thing that only God has control over everything. And if so, does he have a plan? And is that plan in effect now? Even what I'm doing, sitting here, moving, doing what I'm doing, is this all part of a plan? Or do I have free will? What is the free will that's mentioned that I've been talking about in so many of our episodes? Free will. You said there is jinn and you said they have free will. You said there's malayaka or angels and they don't have free will. You said there's human beings and they have free will. So if everybody's got free will, then where does this destiny business come from? What's that all about? What are you talking about? First of all, I want you to go back, check our episodes, and you'll notice that I used the word choice. I didn't say that you had free will. If I did, what I mean by that is you have the will to choose only. No more than that. But let us, let us go through and see if Islam insists that you have to believe in this qadr or predestination of Allah. There's a beautiful hadith or story about Muhammad, peace be upon him, that one day while he was amongst his companions, he told them, ask me some question. Ask me any question about Islam, go ahead. And they were too shy. They didn't like to ask questions. He was the prophet after all. He was the one who had been sent to them. And they were shy to ask him anything. Then Allah sent somebody and they said, a man came up out of the desert. Suddenly he just appeared and he had no traces of travel on him. His clothes were exceedingly white, meaning there was no dust or dirt on him. His hair was exceedingly black, meaning that again, no dust, no dirt, no signs of travel. He looked like somebody local. And there he is right in front of them. And they said he went right up to the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he squatted down and he put his knees to his knees and he put his hands on his thighs, looked him straight in the eye. And he said, what is he man 
Iman in Arabic would mean what is the faith, what is the belief system. Muhammad, peace be upon him, responded, it's to believe in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers, and the hereafter, the resurrection, and the Qadr, the Qadr of Allah. This hadith continues and talks about some other things, but the thing that I want to emphasize here is this Qadr. At the end of the hadith, the end of the story, it says that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, asked Omar, go find this man, go bring him to me. Omar came back and said, I can't find him, he just disappeared. He said, you know who that was? That was actually the angel Gabriel. He came to teach you your religion. So it is, in fact, a very important part of Islam to believe in this Qadr of Allah, this predestination. But how do we believe in it? How do we understand it? First of all, we're human, and we can't think like God. We can't be like Allah in any way but we can take information from him. And he's giving us the guidance in the Quran and in the Hadith that come with Muhammad. Read it and understand it. Now listen, listen to this. Prophet Muhammad told us the first thing that Allah created was a pen. And then he ordered the pen to write. And the pen wrote everything that was going to happen, everything. Then the pen is laid down, the ink is dried, and in this condition, Allah now creates everything. So he never created anything until after it was all written to start with. This is what we know in Islam. Again, though, the person would say, if it's already written, then why go through it? Why do we have to go through this scenario? What's it all about? I don't get it. Again, in the creation of everything that exists, Allah brings things in stages, step by step. He could have created everything all at once. Boom, it's just there. But he didn't, because that's not his way. He has what's called a sunnah, or a way that he does things. Allah has a sunnah. It's called sunnah to law. The way that he does things in stages, step by step, by step. He first created the heavens and earth. He told us that. He created everything in six periods of time called ayum. We often refer to a day, the period of time of a day. But yom, as in Yom Kippur, the Jewish celebrate Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. The Muslims also have their days, their yom. We have Yom Kiyama, for instance, which is the day of resurrection when everybody is standing again. But those periods don't necessarily have to be a 24-hour period. They're stages. Allah brought things in stages. And likewise, he brought the human being and gave them stages of development. He tells us, he tells us about these stages, and then he says he has perfected, perfected our way so that all the human beings and all the jinn together can worship him the way he wants to be worshipped without partners, without associates. And that's the message of Islam. And how does that apply to the cutter, though? Well, all of us, Allah tells us, were inside the backbone of Adam. And he pulled us all out, and he asked us, am I not your Lord? And we all said yes. And then he took those souls, you and I and all the rest, and put them back into Adam, and he erased that from our memory. I don't remember it. You don't remember it. But we were created to forget. In the Arabic language, humans are not called humans. They're called insan, from the same root as the word to forget. Nasiya, insan, those who were created to forget, and we forgot about our meeting with our Lord. Totally and completely. We also forgot we're going to meet him again. We're going to be back in front of him again on the day of judgment. He tells us in the Quran, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. You all came from Allah. And the final 
event is to be returned back to him. You're going to be back in front of Allah again, soon enough. And we know that. That's also a part of the Qadr, part of the predestination. It's going to happen. There's no doubt about it. We've already discovered that this is what Islam teaches, that Allah already knows what's going to happen. He has control over everything all the time. He never makes any mistakes. He doesn't forget, however we do. <laughs> and it's all going to happen according to his plan. That's how it's going to be. Now the questions come. How is that fair? I mean, if it's written, then it's not my fault if I did something bad. It was written for me. I can't help that. Or why should some people get to go to paradise and others have to go to hell? That doesn't seem fair. If it was already written, why not let everybody just go to paradise? In fact, if it's already written, why bother? Why should we even worry about it? I can't do anything about it. God's got the control, so I'm not going to do anything. All of these are questions and insinuations that come up out of the ignorance of understanding who is Allah really, and what is Islam really, and who are we. Human beings cannot think like gods or God. And there's only one God, Allah, and we can't think like that. We're human. Now, we have, in fact, been informed, at least to the extent to know there's a God. And we also have choices that we can make every day. We have a brain, and we can choose between right or wrong. And inside of us, there's something we call it the conscious. Allah tells us that it's our ruh, our soul, our nafs, our insides, you know, ego, we'll call it talking to us to do good or to do bad. But don't you know the difference? I mean, really? Do you know it's wrong to lie? Yeah. Do you know it's wrong to kill? Oh, yeah, yeah. Cheating is bad? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Adultery? Well, you know. No, it's bad. Okay, it's bad. Smoking, drinking, drugs, all these things are good or bad? Well, it's bad. And you know the difference, yeah. So when you choose to do this or that, whose choice was it? Yours, yeah. But Allah already knew the choices you would make ahead of time. And then he allows you to go through this scenario called this life. But he tells you in the Quran that this life is nothing but frivolity. It is nothing. This is not the real life. He did not create it in jest. Oh, no. Huh. Allah was very serious in the way he created it. But for you and I, this temporary life that we live in here, this few years that we spend stomping around on his earth, is actually the proving ground for us. This is the place that we go through the scenario that winds up being the determining factor for us on the day of judgment. And he's the only judge. What's he going to look to, really? Is he going to look to your deeds? Or is he going to look to the intention behind the deeds? And that's the first and foremost of the teaching of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If you go to the books of hadith, or traditions or narrations of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, you will find that the very first hadith in Sahih Bukhari, the first hadith, mentioned in Imam al-Nawawi's Riyad al-Salahin, the first hadith mentioned in al-Arba'in, which is the 40 hadith. All of these scholars chose this hadith to be the leading one. And so many scholars since then have used this when they begin to speak or write about any subject in Islam, any facet of Islam. They start out telling you, Innama amala bin niyat. This is a saying of Muhammad 1400 years ago, that he said, and Omar heard him and reported it to us, that every single action is going to be rewarded according to the intention behind it. Every amal, every action is recorded and then rewarded, punished according to the niya. Niya means your intention. What was it you wanted when you did it? What did you expect to happen? So if you accidentally did something, this wouldn't count against you in Islam. 
But if you intended to do something, of course it would count against you. But to come back to the qadr, how could I do a bad deed or a good deed and have it accounted or attributed to me if it's already planned, if it's already a part of Allah's destiny? Watch this. The mistake comes from the human being who's sitting there thinking that he has free will. We talk about it, but we don't realize what we're saying. Do you have free will? Do you have free will? And if your answer is yes, I have a question for you. Can you make it rain? And if it's raining, can you make it stop? And if it's dark, can you make the sun come out? I'll go one better. So easy for you. You as a human being right now, can you make one hair grow out of your face? Go ahead. Go ahead. And if you can't, then where is your free will? You don't really have will. You have choices. You're making choices. It's being offered to you X or Y, and you're choosing. A or B, and you're choosing. One or two, and you're choosing. You're constantly making choices, but you never really have control over the situation. You say, for instance, tomorrow I will go to work and I will take the train. But you don't really know that because you can't control. You can't control the train that's going to be there on time or the train will even run at all. Maybe it will rain real, real hard and they'll shut the trains down. That happens. Maybe you won't have a job tomorrow. Somebody calls you from the office and said you got fired or the company's out of business. Whoa. Or maybe you won't even wake up. Maybe you'll oversleep. You sleep all day, or maybe you won't wake up at all. Maybe you'll die in your sleep tonight. So where's your will? If you have willpower, why don't you just will that you keep on living and you don't die? And you can't do that either, huh? Hmm. It's only Allah who has will, and his will is what's going to happen and it's already known to him. But the key here, now pay attention because this is the key, this is the answer. You and I don't know what his will is. We don't know. Oh, we have some clues, by the way, of some things, some general picture. As Muslims, we know that for sure, those who are believing in him, trying their best, have a good chance to go to paradise. That we know. We know there is a paradise. We know there's a hell. We know there's a day of judgment. But who's going to go? I don't know. And you don't know. Who will go to paradise? And who will go to hell? I don't know. And you don't know. What we know is the kind of person who goes to paradise is a good person who believes, does good works, and repents for their sins. The kind of person that goes to hell is the disbeliever who rejects the proof when it comes to them. He rejects the fact that there really is God and he refuses to do good deeds. He doesn't even take care of the poorest poor that just need a morsel of food. Yes, these people would be destined to hell, but who are they? I don't know and you don't know. Because as Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said, a person can go through the whole life acting so bad, so evil, that he's almost within an arm's length of being in hell, but then what is written for him, his cutter, his destiny, which is written for him, overtakes him, and as a result, he acts like somebody from paradise. When he dies, he goes to the paradise. Then another person he described would be so good in this life, and so kind, and so generous, and so sweet, and so loving, and you'd think, oh my God, this guy is what? He's got to go to paradise. In fact, he becomes so close to paradise, he could almost reach into it. But then what's written for him overtakes him, and he acts like somebody from the hell. And as a result, when he dies, he goes to hell. Now, some people might ask you about that. Now, wait a minute. This guy was acting good, and then God forced him to go to hell. Why? Or this guy was acting so bad, but then God forced him to go to paradise. I don't get it. I still don't see it. Go back. 
And think what I told you to start with. You don't know, I don't know, but you and I have choices. I'm making choices right now to be sitting here talking to you. And you're making choices to sit there and listen. It's a choice. You don't have to listen. I don't have to stay here, but I want to. And you want to know what I'm going to say next, so you stay. It's a choice. And Allah knows when he creates something, already everything about it, its whole nature. And he knows that there are those who will do some good in this life, but they're really evil. And he knows there are those who will do some evil in this life, but they're really good. So what does he do? And we know from the teaching of Islam that Allah punishes some people in this life so they won't have to suffer in the next life. And he also gives some people good in this life because they're not going to get any good in the next life. Simply because of their nature. He knows what he made and it's up to him. He created you, but you always have that choice. Choose now. Choose right now. I did. You'll be glad you did. Choose the right path. Choose to submit to God on his terms in peace. And that word in Arabic, submission to God in peace, is Islam. You can do it. All you have to do is say, God, guide me. Make it your choice. Let him have his will here on earth as it is in heaven. That's told to us before by the prophets. It's told to us by Muhammad. God's will on earth as it is in heaven. That's the Qadr of Allah.